Well, welcome once again to the Gospels and Acts, GSA. And if you recall, we've been speaking about the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, you remember that we spoke about Jesus calling these men up and having a serious conversation with them, where he was then going to actually deputize them, authorize them, and send them to do the work. For, our, for us, the message is the same. Today, we still have to do the work of the kingdom because it's still continuing. Now, tonight's lecture is, in your books and your notes, it is 2.7, the commission of the committed. The commission of the committed. Our objective tonight is to introduce the 12 apostles and to understand the cost and the reward of discipleship. We're going to have a bit of a conversation about discipleship. We're talking about the commission and the commitment. Now, who knows who the 12 apostles were? Who were the 12 apostles? How many can you name? You'd be surprised that Luke wasn't one, but anyway. <laughs> okay, if, 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 okay, so write down the names of the 12 apostles on a piece of paper without looking at your book. Just write it down. I'll give you a few minutes. You don't look at the book, but just write down as many as you can remember. Okay, so we will get back to that. I just wanted to sort of let you know that most of the time people sit in church for years but they don't really know the 12 apostles or the 12 disciples. So we're going to talk about them tonight which is quite nice for us in Bible school because you're going to probably learn a bit about them. So shortly after Jesus concluded his teaching on the mountain with an awesome invitation, he commissioned 12 disciples to be his apostles. Now the word apostle, what does that mean? So if you look at the, the dictionary definition, the apostle means one who is sent out. In the New Testament, there are two primary uses of the word apostle. The first is specifically referring to the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. The second is in generically referring to other individuals who are sent out to be messengers or ambassadors of Jesus Christ. But the word apostle means one who is sent. So Jesus sent the twelve and if we read Matthew 9.35 it reads, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. What does that mean, that scripture? So, even though you have a lot of Christians, a lot of times you, you might not have a lot of workers. Because of the fact that even today the churches become very religious. People go to church, they attend church, they want to follow some religious activities in the church and then they go home again. And they get sort of satisfaction out of the attendance of the church. But the intention of the kingdom is harvesters that go into the fields. Remember what we learned in the Sermon on the Mount. We are supposed to be the salt and we are supposed to be the light. So there is a purpose. He says to them, in Matthew 10, 16, that I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. So in essence, he's saying to them, listen, it might not always be easy as you go out and engage the world. 
and you meet up with the kingdom of darkness and you have to stand against the kingdom of darkness so you will be like sheep among the wolves but there's a lot of promises as he's sending them out that he says to them i'm with you don't worry you will lay your hands on the sick they will recover you will drive out the devils and they will leave so he he, he not only sends them out but he also authorizes them and he gives them authority something that we'll discuss in upcoming lectures more if we look at this situation then we understand that the road of the disciple the saint one the apostle even is not an easy one because you are going like sheep among the wolves he also says that our priority must be the kingdom in matthew 10 37 he says anyone who loves their father or their mother more than me is not worthy of me anyone who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me he takes it a step further by saying in uh, matthew 10 39 whosoever finds their life will lose it and whosoever loses their life for my sake will find it so he says you cannot love your father your mother your brother your sister your work anything more your priority has to be the kingdom remember what we read in matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you if you go and do a study of discipleship scriptures and you go and see what jesus said about discipleship you will see that the term today is not really accurately portrayed in the church because it really talks about a priority now we want to talk about the 12 so let's do that if you look at one of the places in the bible matthew jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness these are the names of the 12 apostles now there he gives the name so first we've got simon who is called peter then we've got simon's brother who's called andrew james the son of zebedee and his brother philip so the first four we have brothers we've got peter we've got andrew brothers we've got james and we've got john they are brothers then we've got philip we've got bartholomew we've got thomas and matthew the tax collector james the son of alpheus and then thaddeus and then simon the zealot and judas iscariot there are many lists of the disciples and the apostles as the gospels declare them uh, you can do a study of those lists and you will see that all the names on those lists are exactly the same matthew 10 verse 2 to 4 which we just read then mark 3 verse 16 to 19 luke 6 verse 14 to 16 and acts chapter 1 verse 13 also provides us with a list of these men now what you will find a lot of times is if you start reading the bible and you really start reading all the gospels you might find that it looks like the gospels have differences as far as the calling of the disciples are concerned so it actually looks like you know there's there are conflicts in the gospels as far as the calling is concerned there's a reason for that there's a reason why the gospels have different perspectives on the calling of the disciples i would like to suggest that if you really study the gospels you will find that the calling of the disciples were done in phases if you go to john chapter 1 verse 35 to 51 and you read you will read andrew john peter and philip and nathaniel encountered jesus for the first time this event occurs near the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the wilderness near the Jordan River where John the Baptist was ministering. Andrew and John and the others were there because they were already disciples of John the Baptist. But when they heard their teacher, John the Baptist, when they heard him single out Jesus and say, Behold, the Lamb of God, they followed him. So this was phase one of the calling they heard he was the lamb of god and they followed him 
Andrew, John, James, Philip, and Nathaniel. Now, what does this illustrate? Well, this was their first calling. It was the calling to conversion. So, it illustrates that when we are called to Jesus Christ and we hear that He is the Lamb of God, like John declared, and we follow Him, it is a type of a call to conversion. But it's not necessarily a call to full-time ministry. At this stage, the disciples did not get involved in full-time ministry. They were following Jesus. They were listening to His teachings. And you will see that all of Jesus' main discourses was actually directed to the disciples. Many of the discussions that's written in the Gospels were the disciples asking Him questions. So His attention was towards them. But during this first encounter, they had a revelation that He was the Lamb of God. So they became a disciple. But if we find them in the Gospels, we will see that they were not yet in full-time ministry because they were still mending their fishing nets and still fishing and still carrying on. Although they were disciples and followers of Jesus, they had not yet basically moved in with Him and said, listen, we're going to move together and we're going to follow you every day. They still went to go fish. They still went to go do their work and then they would listen to Jesus. That is why we call this then phase one. So then in phase two, we find phase two of their calling was the call to ministry. That is in Luke chapter 5 that describes that event in detail. Now on this occasion, Jesus pushed out from the shore. But let's just take a step back. Jesus walks to the sea and Simon Peter and his partners, the four of them who were fishing partners, they had been fishing the entire night. They had been throwing the nets in, taking them out. Throwing them in, taking them out. Cleaning the debris out of the nets for the whole night. They fished all night. By the time Jesus came there, they were busy cleaning the nets. You can read that in the Gospel account. They were busy cleaning the nets. So that meant that they were cleaning the nets, they were packing them away, and they were on their way to go and sleep. So Jesus comes to Simon. Now remember, Simon already knows Jesus, Simon Peter, because he met him in John chapter 1 that we just read. He was with John, so he met him. So he was a disciple of Jesus, and that's why when Jesus said to him, Simon, let me preach from your boat. Simon said, okay, preach from the boat. So Jesus was preaching. It says, after he finished teaching, he instructed Peter, launch out into the deep water and put in your net. So Peter did so even though the timing was wrong. Fish were easier to catch at night when the water was cooler and the fish were feeding on, on the surface. The place was wrong. Fish normally fed in the shallow waters. Jesus says, launch out into the deep. It was easier to catch them. And Peter was exhausted, having fished all night. So, Peter obviously does this because he knows that Jesus is the Lamb of God. So, and he's just listened to Jesus' teaching. And he told Jesus, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. But nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And the results were overwhelming. The results were a catch of fish that almost sank the boats. That's how many fish they caught. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I once listened to some historical information where they said that the amount of fish that they caught that day was sufficient to supply their ministry needs in terms of finances for their families. Remember, Peter was married, so he had a family. And the amount of fish they caught was sufficient to supply their ministry needs for the three and a half years and to pay off all their debts that they had. I mean, we can't confirm that in the Bible, but there was a reason why Jesus gave them this miraculous catch. There was a reason why He did it, because it was part of the calling. Now again, we're looking at ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ and we're saying, We've heard that He's the Lamb of God. 
and we've received that. And we've said we're following you, Jesus. We're a disciple. We want to receive your word. And that there comes that time when you are called to function in the kingdom. You are called to do what you were destined to do, what you were born to do. This is that time for them. And then they are blessed with a miraculous catch that actually supplies the physical needs. They are then able to actually leave. It was on the heels of that miracle that Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The scripture says it was at that point that they forsook all and they followed him. So here they are basically with Jesus day and night. And that is why it sometimes looks like there's different accounts, um, you know, of the conversion, but it was because it was in phases. There's actually a phase three that I also want to suggest to you. And that phase is actually the phase where he called them to be apostles. It was at this point that Christ selected and appointed the 12 men in particular and made them his apostles. In other words, his sent ones. And to who did he send those apostles in Matthew chapter 10, you can read, Jesus sent out the twelve. Jesus called his twelve disciples. He gave them authority. Remember what I said? He gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. And then he provides us with the names of the twelve, which we just read. And in verse 5, he says, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go amongst the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Now where did he send them? To? Why? Think of it. Come on Bible school students, let those juices flow between your ears. Why would he send them to Israel? In Acts chapter 13 verse 46 I read, Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, It was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected it and judged yourself unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles. This is what Paul says in Acts. Uh, as he turns his ministry, the Apostle Paul, which was not one of the original apostles of Jesus, but he, as an apostle in the true word of it, we'll talk about that just now. But he says, we had to preach to the Jews first, and then we could only turn to the Gentiles. Because the Jews had the fair and legitimate right to accept or reject the covenant because the original covenant was with the Jews so in all fairness God had to preach first to the lost sheep of Israel and those guys from Israel who accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior they came and entered into the new covenant from the old covenant but those who rejected obviously were excluded because of the fact that they rejected it so Jesus's first mission and this is why he resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem to complete what he was supposed to do. But as he was moving towards Jerusalem, he was rushing through all the towns, preaching and demonstrating the kingdom of God to the Jewish people so that they could have the opportunity to accept him. As soon as they rejected him, then we, the Gentile nations, were then allowed to come into the covenant because of the fact that their disobedience actually brings us into obedience. It's a strange concept, but it's again the, the Jacob and Esau situation where the younger rules over the older and where, where we are now the second brother that's now actually entered into covenant with God. So the current covenant that God has, the God of the universe has, is the covenant that he established with his son Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which John said to these men, this is the Lamb of God. So this Lamb of God came 
and he fulfilled the old covenant and he brings us into this new covenant and after the Jewish people rejects Jesus the gospel opens up the covenant offer opens up to the nations of the world but if you really study biblical prophecy you will see that in most of the prophecies it is addressed to the nations yes there's a great focus in the first few books of the Bible on Abraham Isaac Jacob and the Jewish nation but it starts moving in the prophecies towards the inclusion of all nations but Jesus as the Son of God as the Lamb of God had to come in the flesh he had to live a perfect sinless life and then he had to give the Jewish people the opportunity to receive him and if they rejected then the Gentile nations were capable of coming that's why he says he has a banquet and he's inviting all the prestigious guests and everybody's got an excuse I can't come I've got this I just bought a field I just got married I just got an oxen I I can't come I can't come then he says okay now go into the highways and the byways you've already invited all the prestigious people the Sadducees the Pharisees the priests they were all invited the tribes of uh, Israel they were all invited but now they've rejected so now the Gentiles can come in it's a big conversation to have but this is how the Apostle Paul comes into the Apostles actually as an Apostle to the Gentiles where you know his ministry was directed to the Gentiles that's why we've got all the books of Paul in our Bible uh, and less books of the other Apostles but the epistles were directed to the gentile churches as paul was establishing those churches so that's why he had to instruct them to go and preach to the lost sheep of israel and not to go to the gentiles and then he says heal the sick raise the dead cleanse those who have leprosy drive out demons freely you have received freely you give there's patterns in the scripture of instruction of how we can function in ministry today because although this instruction was given there in Matthew chapter 10 to the original 12 apostles as they received the apostleship remember Jesus went and he he prayed the whole night and then he called them after the sermon on the mount and then he sent them uh, but it's a pattern for us to follow because we see the same instruction uh, coming in the Great Commission text which we will also still discuss uh, or, the, or the culmination of the Great Commission text over the various places where you find it in the Bible and then we also see this pattern repeat itself in the early church in the book of Acts and then also we see it in church history uh, we see the same pattern repeat itself but there's a lot you can learn from this as you study it and I suggest you do study it he's talking about if a home deserves your peace let it rest on that home if it doesn't let your peace return to you meaning that if somebody doesn't receive you and reject you then don't labor that don't let your peace be lost because of the rejection that you are receiving or experiencing rather shake the dust of your feet and move on if anyone does not welcome you or listen to your words leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet and then remember what we said in verse 16 I'm sending you like sheep among the wolves so for us tonight as we studying the lives of the Apostles we're just looking at them and we get an idea of how they were called in the phases that I discussed they came to a place where they understood Jesus was the Lamb of God uh, they were on the mountain they were listening to his words they were receiving from him and then they were eventually uh, at a place where he came and he called them and he said listen now I'm calling you to what you have to do so you have to leave your fishing uh, careers now you have to leave your businesses and now you have to follow me and he called them and then he commissioned them and he sent them so they were commissioned and they were they were required to commit 
they were required to make that commitment because it doesn't work without the commitment. Because they had to be empowered. Remember what Jesus said to them and what He is saying to us is wait and tarry in Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high, dunamis, until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives them that whole teaching on the Holy Spirit to tell them this is what you're going to need to be able to function. But to receive the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit and to keep in step with the Spirit, you have to have a relationship with Jesus. The type of relationship where you are with Him every single day. That is how they were. They were tied to Him for three and a half years. They were sleeping in the same places. They were walking in the same places. They were eating in the same places. They were together all the time. And that's how he trained and developed them to the point where he could actually use these 12, which was 11, and then they chose another one, and then the Apostle Paul comes with. So you might be back at 13. Uh, if, you, if you add in Paul and Matthias, and you remove Judas, but he, he uses them to turn the whole world around. And today the influence of Christianity is basically felt on every single continent and it is a, a, a testimony to the work that he did through these men's lives and the greatest thing is as we look at the just briefly look at them as, as people we will see that they weren't necessarily the people that you know you might have chosen yourself because it was against all odds that these men would succeed. We've got, for instance, we've got Andrew, which was a fisherman. He was Simon Peter's brother. And Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And he followed Jesus. As far as we know, these fishermen were not educated. We've got Peter. And I mean, we know a lot about Peter because Peter used to put his foot in his mouth a lot. We know that he lived in Capernaum. He was a fisherman, Matthew 4:18. Uh, we know that his brother was Andrew. We know that they were partners in the business with James and John. We know that he was married. Uh, you can see that in Matthew 8:14. Uh, eventually, he ended up being a pillar in the church in Jerusalem. You can see that in Galatians 2:9. He boldly preached and ministered to Jews and Gentiles after Pentecost. You can see that in Acts chapter 2. But if you look at his personality, uh, you, you can see that he was in, impulsive. Math, Matthew 14, 28. Peter was sometimes impulsive. He would say things before he thought, let's build a tent here on the Mount of Transfiguration and things like that. He was slightly cowardly, if he doesn't mind me saying that. And uh, in, in Matthew 26, 69, uh, we see him denying Christ three times. He was hot-tempered. We see him cutting off a, a man's ear. And I think that was in John 18.10. Um, and as far as the historians uh, uh, say, they say that there was a whole delegation of soldiers. A whole delegation of, of soldiers that came uh, with the high priest's uh, God and, and with the high priest's servant. And uh, Peter cut off this man's ear and he was armed with a sword and there were all these other men with swords. So, yeah, he was so hot-tempered that he didn't think that what, what was going to happen to him uh, after he cut the guy's ear off. He was sometimes insightful. In Matthew 16, 16, you can see it. Yet he was sometimes dense. Because in Matthew 16, he has this revelation that Jesus is the Christ. And then when Jesus says he has to die in verse 21, he says, no, you can't die. So, you know, he's insightful. He receives this revelation. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. But then all of a sudden, you know, Jesus says to him, go away from me, Satan. Because he's trying to stop uh, the purpose. So there's a lot of different aspects. As you study his life, you can see that. Uh, you can look at John, who was also a fisherman. He was the brother of James. His father was Zebedee. And Jesus trusted him to take his mother. And you can see that in John 19, 26, when Jesus was on the cross and he said to John, this is your mother. James was a fisherman. 
and uh, James uh, was also uh, John's brother and his father was Zebedee and um, this is known as James the Great uh, and then you get James the Less. So there's two James in the disciples or the apostles. Then we've got Thomas. What do you know about Thomas? So he's known as, you can see he's laughing there, because he knows he's known as the doubting Thomas of John 20, uh, 25. He was actually a very analytical guy. He was a very logical guy. And as far as the scholars say, they say that he was probably the only uh, semi-biblical scholar in the group. The others were not scholars by a long shot. What was Matthew? So I mean, Jesus is using quite a strange bunch of people. Have you ever heard that you swear like a sailor? Fisherman. Fisherman is a rough trade. So you've got these four fishermen. Then you've got Thomas, which is like we say, the doubting Thomas. Uh, we've got Matthew, the tax collector. Now, what do you know about tax collectors? Yeah, tax collectors were not liked because they were collecting money on behalf of the Roman government from their own people. And most of the time they were, they were stealing money. There's quite a few surprises in the apostles if you look at them. Another surprise is a zealot, Simon. Now, what do you know about Simon, the zealot? So the zealots were almost like terrorists. They would assassinate Roman soldiers publicly and, and gruesomely uh, to send shock into the Roman community. It is because of the zealot uprising that the temple was actually destroyed in 70 AD, historically. Because the zealots the group that Simon was a part of, they militantly started attacking the Roman Empire to the point where they actually took over Jerusalem. And the Roman Empire was trying to get in and they were fortifying the city. And for a long period of time, the Romans were crucifying people outside of the city and the zealots were holding the fort. And by the end of the day, they said they were cru crucifying like... I think they said 5,000 people in a certain period. They were crucifying them publicly so that the people inside the city could see this. So on the outside you had the Roman army surrounding the city. On the inside you had the zealots that took over. This is what they were working at. And this is the guy that Jesus actually recruit, recruited as a disciple. He was a terrorist. But Titus uh, eventually got through and opened up Jerusalem and because opened up the fortification and he went in and because he was so angry uh, he w they went to the temple and, and before the Romans he could stop actually the Roman soldiers they had broken down the entire temple that there was no stone left on each other and they had carried off all the stones of the temple and the prophecy that Jesus had prophesied when he looked at the temple and he said to them you see this temple not one stone will remain here in 70 AD that prophecy was fulfilled. The zealots played a part in that because they made the Romans so angry that they demolished the temple. And that changed the entire system of Judaism because they no longer had a temple. So they had to move to a different system of, of, um, of, of, of uh, religion. So now you've got a zealot who hates the Roman government and you've got a tax collector who loves the Roman government and you bring them all in as a disciple. You've got your, you've got your fishermen. Then you've got James, uh, the son of Alphaeus, uh, who's known as James the Less. He was also, he's also the, the one who wrote the book of James. And then we've got Philip from Bethesda, who brought Bartholomew to Jesus. And then we've got Bartholomew, who was also called Nathaniel. And this is the guy that Jesus saw sitting under the fig tree. And then one of the favorites that everybody loves to discuss is we've got Judas. <laughs> Judas Iscariot. Uh, who's named your children Judas? Why not? You know, Judas was a very popular name. 
uh, before this. <laughs> this guy actually messed up the name. So we've got Ju Judas uh, Iscariot, who was the treasurer. And uh, the gospel tells us that he helped himself out of the treasury. And he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Matthias took his place as a disciple and as an apostle. We don't know much about Matthias. He doesn't really uh, feature much. And then we've also got Thaddeus, who is called Jude. So those basically are the 12. And then when Judas falls away, we've got Matthias who takes his place. And then obviously what I've also mentioned is the Apostle Paul, who was an apostle in, in, in the full right, who saw the, the, the light on the way to Damascus as Saul was going to persecute the church. He met Jesus. He became a follower of Christ and he became a, an apostle and also a, a great apostle to the Gentile nations. A powerful man of God and then Matthias. But if we're talking about the twelve, obviously we're talking about Andrew, Simon, Peter, John, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Simon, James, Judas. So these were the men that were originally called and they were uh, commissioned by the Lord and they had to commit themselves. And we can see that these were ordinary men. They were not uh, exceptional men. Uh, Jesus actually made a statement almost against the institutionalized religion by not choosing any rabbis, any priests, any Pharisees, any Sadducees in the sense of going to, to choose the cream of the crop. Use the capacity that God has placed inside of those people to transform their communities. It's the same with us today. The devil wants to try and tell us that we're not good enough. Uh, he wants to tell us that we can't do it. And he chose these men. He spent that time with them. And as he was spending that time, he built into them the values of the kingdom of God. He demonstrated to them the patterns of the kingdom of God, the power of the kingdom of God. And then when he left, they continued the mission. And today, in the church of Jesus Christ, we are still continuing that mission. It's still carrying on. We are still the solution. We are descendants of all of these men. They were willing to pay with their lives. And I looked at Fox's Book of Martyrs of the deaths that all of the disciples died. And um, they were willing to give their lives. That's how much they believed. Remember we spoke about this as excruciating evidence where we say that, I mean, nobody would die for something if you don't believe in it. And they were all willing to die. And I'll just give you quickly some of the information of how these men died and what price they paid. Simon Peter spread the gospel in Jerusalem and abroad, including Antioch. He died by crucifixion. And according to tradition, he asked to be uh, crucified upside down. Uh, his death was prophesied by Jesus in John uh, 21, 18. So he died. There's this uh, story or this, I won't say historical account, but it's more a traditional account in Fox's Book of Martyrs of Peter walking out of the city and then Jesus walking towards him as he was warned that they wanted to kill him. And then Jesus walking towards him and he was looking and seeing Jesus was going into Rome and he said, where are you going? And, and, and he said, I'm going to be crucified again. And, it, and what it says there is that Peter then perceived that that was the death by which he would glorify God. So he turned around and he willfully went and he laid his life down, but he requested that his crucifixion would be upside down. So this fisherman, this man with his foot in his mouth, a lot of times he willingly laid down his life. And then Jude, the brother of James, uh, was commonly called Thaddeus, and he was crucified at Edessa in AD 72. Bartholomew preached in several countries, having translated the Gospel of Matthew into the language of, the, of India. He propagated it um, in that country, and um, he was at length cruelly beaten 
and then crucified by impatient idolaters. You see, terrible death to die. Thomas Didymus preached the gospel in Parthia, India, where he excited the rage of the pagan priests. He was martyred by being thrusted through with a spear. Simon the Zealot, surnamed Zealotus, preached the gospel in Mithania, Africa, and even in Britannia, in the latter country, he was crucified in AD 74. John traveled and spread the gospel until uh, he was sent to Rome. They attempted to boil him in oil, which failed, so he was banished to Pathmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. Now, John is the only one of the twelve that died in old age and wasn't martyred. James, the son of Zebedee, his death was the second account of the martyrdom in the Bible. Uh, you will remember that in Acts chapter 12, you, you can read how James the Great was martyred in, um, during uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Philip labored diligently in Upper Asia and suffered martyrdom at Helipolis. He was scourged, thrown in prison, and afterwards crucified in AD 54. I mean, scourged, thrown in prison, and crucified. Matthew, it is believed, uh, much of Matthew's ministry was in Africa, including modern-day Ethiopia, and he was killed with a halberd. And James, son of Alphaeus, who um, was elected uh, the oversight of the churches in Jerusalem and the author of the epistle ascribed to James in the sacred uh, canon. At the age of 94, he was beaten and stoned by the Jews. And finally, uh, he had his brains dashed out with the fullest love. Terrible, eh? I mean, we think we've got problems. <laughs> Matthias, not much is known of his ministry, though the tradition holds that he was stoned and beheaded. It's actually quite depressing in a sense when you think of it. But these men were willing to pay with their lives. Um, let's not leave Andrew out. We didn't talk about Andrew, did we? Andrew was the brother of Peter. He preached the gospel um, sort of in the Asian nations. Uh, at his arrival at the Dese, he was taken uh, and crucified on a cross. So he was also crucified. So we can see that these men were ordinary men, called for an extraordinary purpose, and enabled by the Holy Spirit to fulfill that purpose, and they were willing to pay with their lives. Uh, they were willing to, to pay and to do anything that they were supposed to do for the gospel. Today we have to ask ourselves the question, what price are we willing to pay? Are we really disciples? Do we know that Jesus is the Lamb of God? That's great. And have we come to that point where He's called us and He said, listen, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. It's now time for you to start functioning in the gift that God has placed inside of you. The problem today is that we have this mentality of comfort, mentality of me first culture, mentality of what I want and how I want it. And we have lost the true sense of discipleship. If we really study these men's lives, we can see it. I mean, they left their boats, they left their nets, they left their parents, they left everything. They didn't look behind they put their hands to the plow and they were plowing. Because nobody who looks back is fit for the kingdom. They didn't honor their, their mothers, their fathers, their, or they didn't, I don't want to use the word honor, but they didn't put their father, their mothers, their brothers, or anything above what Jesus wanted them to do, the call. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to, to not only commit ourselves and receive this commission, but to really uh, follow through on that commitment and say, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do it. And they were willing to do that, as we've just read, to the point of sacrificing their very own lives. Giving it all, paying it all, laying it all down. 
Today we are moaning about the chairs are too hard and the services are too long and the place is too hot and the preacher is too loud and the band is too loud and this is wrong and that is wrong. We're concentrating on everything that we want because we've been taught that that's how it works. That's not how it works. Jesus, he, he, he said to Simon, follow me. I'll make you fishes of men and he just walked. Simon had to just throw down everything and follow him. The one guy said, let me first go bury my father. He said, well, let the dead go bury the dead. It's, it's a 100% a, a call to 100% commitment. And we don't really understand that and it's not popular to preach. Because if you have a church and you want to empty that church, preach that level of commitment. Tell them this is how the guys died. This is how they paid for the gospel. This is the price that they paid. You read Paul's sufferings in the book of Corinthians. He says there what he suffered. The shipwrecks. The bandits. The cold nights. The hunger. The things that he went through. The unpleasant things that he went through. And it's not God that put him through those things, but he committed himself to the gospel and that entailed certain traveling and certain things that he had to do and he just pushed forward with that. And he said, there's nothing in this world that can replace what Jesus is to me. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Can we say that today? I mean, people can read it, they can maybe say it, but can they really say it with total conviction and saying, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what we see here as we consider their lives. And that's the call for us. It's that call of commitment. It's only in that place that you are going to find the peace that transcends the understanding and the joy. It's not in the place of comfort zone, consumerism, Christianity, where everything has to be the way you want it. The entire church is designed around your needs, your wants, your desires. Everything is fashioned for you as a customer to come on Sunday and enjoy yourself. It must be great for you. I'm not saying it should be unenjoyable. I mean, there can be enjoyable things. We don't want to, you know, have a life of suffering. But I'm saying that shouldn't be the main focus. No, everything must be great. Everything must be wonderful. And if anything's wrong, I'm going to another church. I mean, that is not real discipleship. We cannot step into the apostleship that God has called us for, the pastorship, the teachership, the evangelism ship, the prophetic ship, if we don't commit ourselves. We say, yes, Lord, I will take the commission and I will make the commitment in Jesus' name.